We welcome you this morning to our service at Abundant Life Fellowship Church from Franklin, Pennsylvania. And we are thankful that you're here to enjoy the service with us. So you can turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to start with the fourth verse. And this is the second half of this service, so we'll cover a little bit of what we went through last week just to kind of bring everybody up to date. Isaiah chapter 53, starting with the fourth verse. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. <clears throat> the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was a he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison, made in from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they gave they his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death, because he has done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by the knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, <coughs> or he shall bear their iniquities. And we're talking about being in Jesus. Acts chapter 17, verse 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. In other words, we become his children. We become the children of God when we accept Jesus. And, and we are his offspring. And we are in him. In him we live. And we move. And we have our very being. And, and so we have to understand what it means to be in him. Now we talked about last week the, the lady at the, at the well in Samaria. And, and the living water. You know, the, the living water, the, this is translated from the Greek, and it means a spring or a fountain or a well. And this was the spring that was prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 47, where he talked about the water coming out from the gate from out of the throne room. And as it came out, it formed a mighty river. And, and that is what we have to release to the world is this living water because we're in him and he is in us. And see, once you receive the Holy Spirit, this water is contained in you. It's up to you whether or not you allow it to flow. Don't dam it up. Don't cause the flow to be stopped. Ezekiel says everything will be healed and a great multitude of fish are available to you. Well, Jesus told us we'd be fishers of men. He told the disciples that, and, and it's come down the line to us that we are to be fishers of men. But if we are not fully in him, we can't clean up our own flesh. How many people have you heard say, you know, I've tried to stop doing thus and so, and I just can't seem to stop. Well, it's because we can't clean up our own flesh. Our flesh demands to be coddled all the time. And and see, when we when we get outside of that comfort zone of coddling our flesh, we don't like it. 
So, so rather than clean up our flesh, we just put up with whatever is coming along, and we need to stop doing that and allow him to clean us up because we, we are washed with the washing of the water of the word. And so what, what do we do? Well, we, we, we clean up our flesh by getting in this living water and allowing it to flow through us. You know, if you, if you um, dam up water, it begins to get stagnant. It begins to grow uh, scum on the top of it. It gets stagnant. It gets ugly. You know, fish can't even hardly live in it. And, and any that do, you don't want them to eat because they're not good. But the, the water is stagnant. But if you allow the water to flow, it, it stays pure. It does not stagnate, but rather flows. And, and, and this is what we need to do is don't get stagnant in Jesus. Don't, don't just stop doing, but continue to do what he's called you to do and, and allow that water to flow. The, the terms in him, in whom, by him, or by whom, or by his blood is used over 130 times in the New Testament. You know, God wants us to know this. He wants us to know who we are in him. But see, on the grounds of Jesus' victory over Satan, we have a legal right to accept Jesus as our personal Savior and enter into the kingdom of God's Son. We, we are part of a kingdom that, that cannot be conquered, cannot be defeated, because it's the kingdom of God. And, and when we pray, you know, we're taught the, the Lord's Prayer, which is an outline of, of how we should pray. But when we're taught that, you know, what's he say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, sometimes when we pray, we need to be praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. Why? Because we are the hands and feet and mouthpiece of God on this earth. And we need to be speaking the word and telling people and, and talking to people and, and doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is go into all the world and tell the good news. You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigns through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Christ Jesus. See, we can have total victory in Jesus. Total victory. That's because we're totally redeemed. We're totally set free. And we, are, we have a legal right to everything Jesus accomplished. You know, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 21 says, So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have eternal life. When you receive Jesus, you receive eternal life. Hell is not in your future. We have victory over Satan in sin. People say, well, I, you know, I can't stop this sin. Yes, you can. We have victory over it in Jesus. When you're totally in him, you can take authority over your flesh. Paul said daily, I beat my flesh. Now, that doesn't mean he took a whip and hit himself. That just means that he, he, he commanded his flesh to move and be according to the word of God and not according to what the flesh, not according to what the flesh uh, wanted.
because our flesh, you know, our flesh wants to eat cookies and candy and, and all this stuff. Our flesh wants to, to, to do things that we know we shouldn't do. Our flesh wants to do all that. So what we have to do is we take a victory over that stuff by putting on the armor of God and allowing that sword, that one offensive weapon that we have, which is the sword, which is the, the word of God, and we go forth, we never back up. We never give up. You never give in. You always go forward. Because we have victory over Satan and sin. And the gift is uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So we have victory over that. We have victory over Satan and sin. People say, oh, you don't know what the devil's doing to me, Pastor. Well, take authority over him. Begin to know where he is and what he is. The Bible says he is under our feet. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have problems in this life. Because we do. You know, we, we, we are attacked. We are, we are caused to have problems. But you need to understand, folks, that in this life, we have victory through Jesus. We have victory over sickness and disease. You know, we, we talked this morning about about um, Mickey's wrist, and and this past week I had to have surgery, and you know, and I'm I'm probably gonna well I am gonna have another one here shortly, you know, and, and why stuff happens it we are attacked, and and you need to understand that just like just like an army has invaded our land sometimes. We are being attacked by an army that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And we have to take authority over that thing and, and begin to come at it with a, you know, be the one on the offense. The devil's a liar and the father of lies. That's what the word tells us. Well, what about sickness and disease that happens? First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. And that's not 1 Peter 2.24. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. 1 Peter chapter 2.24 says that, that on the tree he died for our sin. And by his stripes... We were healed. Now, when you're when you're sick, when you're in pain, when you're having problems, it sometimes it's hard to see that. But I want you to understand that according to the Word of God, not according to Alan, not according to to some book I read, but the Word of the Living God, that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. People, you know, people have strange ideas about this. You know, um, I've heard people say, "Well, sometimes, you know, when you ask for healing, God just says no." 
Well, that's not true. He already said yes. Why would he change his mind? He, God doesn't change his mind. So, so what? What is it? What? What causes this problem? Well, what causes this problem is the fact that people get strange ideas. We have to understand that we can walk in total healing. Say, well, Pastor, I don't know that that's possible. It's the Word of God. It's not what I'm saying. And so we have to start we have to start believing the word more than we believe what we feel, what we see, what we what we hear. You know, somebody says, Oh, there's gonna be a a, 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 a um, pandemic. And everybody said, Oh, and we're all gonna get sick. No, we didn't not everybody said that, but a lot of people said, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna get this stuff. We're, you know, we got to run out and and see if we can't get some kind of some kind of treatment and and all." I'm telling you, folks. I'm telling you, as true as I sit here today, that we need to quit believing the newspaper more than we believe the Word of God. We need to quit believing the evening news more than we believe the Word of God. And we need to start believing the Word of God like, like we should because it's the truth. It's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so we need to believe it. See, we have a home in heaven. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We implore you on Christ's behalf. What is, what's it saying? It's saying we're asking in, in Jesus' name for you to become an ambassador. If we send an ambassador to another country, the United States, I'm talking about. If we send an ambassador to another country, they have a home here. This is their home. And when they are in the, the um, residence of the ambassador in that other nation, that residence becomes part of the United States of America. And that ambassador is not the United States, but they speak in that country on behalf of the United States. So most of the time, they can only say what they're told they're allowed to say by our nation. Well, see, we we go around and we, we spout off all the time and we talk all the time and stuff. But if Jesus said, I only do what I hear my father tell me to do. And we need to start being like that in that we do what God tells us to do. God's going to tell you to do something than what he tells me. Something different. Why? Because we're not all the same. He has made us to be individuals. Even though we're all in Christ, we're made to be individuals so that we can take, become the whole body fitly jointed together. You say, well, what does that mean, fitly jointed together? That means that the entire body is all together. You know, I don't know anybody whose hands are just uh, wandering off by themselves. Oh, my, my head, I left it out there in another room. I, I have to go get that. No. Our body is our body. And, you know, if one part of the body hurts, you know, if I hurt this finger, the next thing that happens is the other hand comes to the rescue. See, we need to be like that in the body of Christ. If one part of the body is hurting, the rest of the body needs to come and to their rescue. 
We have the right to use the name of Jesus when we pray. He said in John chapter 14, verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. You know, even in the Psalms, uh, Psalm chapter 91, we see that, that Psalm 91 is a, is a long book by itself. But it talks about the Father's care and his protection. And we, as, as children of God, you know, we stand in God's care and protection. And, you know, you're going to find out someday when, when, when you get to heaven the times that God protected you that you were completely oblivious to what was going on. You know, I remember one time I went to Washington, D.C. Now, I was pretty young, um, in my early 20s, and I, you know, I came from the country. I wasn't... I, I, you know, people are people are people, as far as I knew. I didn't realize that there were bad people when you get into the cities. Not not like I do now. But anyhow, I went to Washington, D.C., and we decided to take a stroll. So we walked from the White House to the Capitol at night, in the dark, just the two of us. And then we turned around and walked back to our hotel, and we got back to the hotel... We were talking to the clerk in the hotel, and we told him what we'd done, and he he about had a fit. He said, "Well, you're you're, you're lucky to be alive." No, we were protected by God. We we just didn't realize that there were angels all around us. And we hear so many stories of of angels protecting people and standing guard over people, and and things happening. You know, that people see angels and. Why? Well, God is protecting us, and he's got an army of angelic beings that are, that are protecting you and I, because he doesn't want his family to be hurt. You know, we, we have this son or daughter placed in the family. You know, when my family used to get together, when my parents and, and even my grandparents were alive, and and we would get together, we would have this big family outing someplace, you know, and, and, and we would do things together, and you didn't feel like an outsider because you're part of the family. And see, we can't be outsiders with God if you know Jesus as your Savior, you're not an outsider. You're a son or a daughter. And we can, we can enjoy our place in the family. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. See, we are joint heirs with Jesus. Now, I live in Pennsylvania. And I know that the laws everywhere aren't the same. But in Pennsylvania, if, if you and I own a piece of land jointly, we're both considered to be 100% owners of that piece of land. Why? Because it, it's joint. And that means that we both have all of it. And it's the same way with God. We're joint heirs with Jesus. That means we are entitled to everything that Jesus does for us, everything that Jesus has for us. We're entitled to it because we're joint heirs with him. If you're not following, I understand because sometimes, you know, it, it takes a while to understand what it means to really be in Jesus. I mean, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What what more could we ask for? He came to live in us 
through his spirit. You know, he, he talks about this in, in the first chapter of Acts and being assembled together with them. And this is starting with verse four, Acts chapter one, verse four. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. See, we, we are entitled to, to be witnesses, faithful witnesses of the, the, the saving, saving uh, nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're to be faithful witnesses, and but we are empowered by Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means that that he will tell you, he will speak through you, he will tell you what to say to people to get them to turn to him. He will tell you what to say to other believers to help them in a situation in their life. Why? Because he's in us and we're in him. We are entitled to live with the Father throughout eternity. We are entitled to live with our Father throughout eternity. And that is, to me, is just amazing. Because eternity, we can't even grasp. We can't even grasp the, the infinite time involved in eternity and yet we're entitled to live with the father for that long that's a blessing we have a right to every good thing that exists i mean first corinthians chapter 3 starting with verse 21 says therefore let no one boast in men for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. So we have that we have that um, blessing that all things, all good things, are ours. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go take somebody else's diamonds. They're theirs. But it does mean that, that we have the right to ask God for what it is we want. And just as, you know, I, I when I was a kid, I would go to my father. I would say, Dad, you know, I need I need a dollar to do this and so or whatever. And he might say well, you know, what are you going to do with it or where are you going to go with it or whatever. But, but he would usually give me the dollar if he had one. You know, when we go to our father, we can expect him to be blessed. I mean, the Bible says if, if he asked for, a, for, for an egg, would you give him a stone or a snake or something? I mean, no, you, you, would, you would give your child what they needed. And see, God gives us what we need, but the, the Bible also says that he will give us the desires of our heart. Now, that means, you know, what we really want. Oh, you know, we see things and we say, oh, I'd like to have one of those. Oh, I'd like to have one of those. Oh, I'd like to have one of those. But, but. Then there are certain things in our life that we desire with all our heart. There are certain things that that we want to make sure we have. Well, 
God will give us the desires of our heart. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. For what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You can say this with me, that God is good. God is, is the very epitome of good. God doesn't ever do anything to hurt his children. He lives to, to you know, he, he, he desires to bless his children. And so when something bad comes your way, you need to understand that this isn't God. This, I mean, there are so many things that in this world today, and we look around and we say, you know, this isn't God. This is this is something else that's causing this to happen. Why? Well, because we are children of the Father in Him. I can't stress enough the fact that being in Jesus is what we're called to be, first of all. And to allow him to have complete control over us through Holy Spirit. You say, well, Pastor, does that mean I just should lay around and pray all day or, you know, get on my knees until I wear holes in the floor or whatever? No. No. No, no, it doesn't mean that. See, we can be in him and him in us, and we can we can walk around and do the things we need to do. And when when he speaks to us, we do what he says. You know, I, I work uh, part time in a, in a, in a, well, not part time, but full time temporary for a company where I have to greet people, whether it be on the phone or or be in person. And there are many people go through my office in the course of a few months. And certain people, God will speak to me to speak to certain people about him. Not everybody but certain people. And and when that person walks through the door, there's something different. And you have to know, oh, I'm supposed to talk to this person. And then God will make the opportunity. You know, one time, several years ago, I had hurt my leg and I was in a, a big boot. And uh, we had gone after church to a restaurant. And we're sitting in the restaurant. And this family, who I didn't know, came in. And when they came in, God spoke to me, you need to get to know these people. Well, I'm sitting there looking like Elijah. I got a, a walking stick staff. I got on this big boot, and he kept saying it every time I, you know, and and they had him set at a table where I was looking directly at them. Every time I looked up, I could see them, and God kept saying, "You get to know them." So finally, we finished eating, and, and I I said to, to Katie, "I have to go talk to these people." Well, who are they? I don't know. Well, what are you going to say to them? I say, I don't know. I'm just, God told me I need to get to know them. Well, then go. 
So I get up and I'm walking with this big stick and, and uh, big boot on it. And I walk back to their table and, and they probably thought it was Elijah coming. They never said, but anyhow, I went to stretch out my hand to shake hands with the man. I, I didn't know him. And I started to tell him who I was. And out of my mouth began to come a prophetic word. And it was just spilling out, spilling out, spilling out, spilling for 10 minutes. And he just kept sliding down and sliding down and sliding down in his seat. And I thought, hmm, I hope this man's a Christian. I hope he understands what's going on here. So finally, you know, the, the Holy Spirit said all he had to say, and the man looked at me, and he said, you just gave me the answer to everything that I prayed about this morning. You just told me the answer to every bit of it. Who are you? And so I introduced myself finally, and, and then I found out that he was a pastor in a town not too far away. Well, he's had me in a few times to preach since then, but we've become good friends, and uh, I really like George. But, see, God will do something like that if you allow him. He will do things like that through you. And, and you know, here's this guy. He's been praying about something, and God told him the answer through a guy he didn't even know. Told him the whole answer. And you can be that person that brings the answer to people if you will just allow him in you and you in him to be one. Because he will only do what he tears the Father tell him to do. And we are his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece on this earth. And we need to quit spouting off all our own thoughts and start telling people what God says. I want you to know I'm by no means perfect. And nobody is except Jesus. But with him in us and us in him, as part of his body, with him as the head, we can win this world. We're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Oh, well, pastors, does that mean I have to go live in a grass hut someplace? And doesn't mean that at all. All the world starts right outside your front door. I mean... With television in our house, we got all the world coming right in our living room. You can't talk to your television, but you can talk to people. Whether it be people at work, people at the store, people wherever, restaurants, doesn't matter. I mean, virtually all the time. Most of the time, anyhow, when when we're at a restaurant, we end up praying for the waiter or waitress that's there. And I've seen waitresses cry. I had one waitress actually fell out when I when I laid hands on her. <laughs> that's another story. But anyhow, I want you to understand something. God will move through you if you move in him. Amen? Look at, and I'm going to close with this verse, but in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. 
We know that he lives in us by his spirit. And see, when, and, and what this is saying is, when you live in Jesus, and Jesus lives in you, then we can do everything, John chapter 14, verse 12, we can do everything that Jesus did and greater things than these because he went to the Father. We can do everything that Jesus did and greater things than these. But we can only do it when we're in him. Amen? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can be in you. And I just pray now in the name of Jesus that this word will become revelation knowledge in the hearts and the lives of every person who hears it. And Father, that they will understand that all the benefits, all the benefits that God offers are in him, in Jesus. So I thank you and I praise you for that revelation. In Jesus' name, amen.